two people. Sam went there. And three and four. Okay, so that's what today's going to be on. We're going to be studying the shroud the entire time. Okay, so what is the shroud? It is a 14 and 3 inch by 3 foot and 7 inch linen cloth. And it contains these imprints of a dude. Uh, uh, it's kind of it's kind of weird. And it's a uh, uh, what's it called? So in biblical measurements in the Bible, they use cubits a lot of the time. Like the ark was measured in cubits, and Goliath's height was measured in cubits. And a cubit is just from your elbow to the tips of your fingers. So that's that's a cubit. Okay. So cubit is just the measurement they use. Like this doesn't have to do with the test. This is just info I'm giving. Oh, God. I'm, I'm, I'm giving like that. Don't worry. It's still interesting. Okay. So this is the most studied artifact in history. You can think of anything, and this is the most studied. Okay. It's been under study for, I think it was 10, no, 12 years. It was under study for 12 years. Okay. So, it's a piece of lin linen cloth with what's called a herringbone weave. So it's like, it's this pattern where it goes up, it, no, it goes down, up, down, up, down, up, all the way throughout, okay? And it has the front and back imprints of a man who had been crucified, okay? And we can tell that because here, there's blood coming out of his wrist, and blood on his head. No? Kind of foreign, so... Uh, so... We can corroborate this with all four Gospels because all four Gospels account for Christ having been wrapped in a sheet, okay? All right, so when they were developing this film, the guy, it was like an old-timey camera. So he takes a photo, and then he takes it to the room where he develops the photos, and out came this photo. And what's interesting about this is this is a negative image, Okay. So usually, when you take a photo of something, out comes a positive image. The light, is, or no. What's dark is light, and what's light is dark, okay? But this flipped it around. So, uh, yeah, this gives us a clearer image into what he could have looked like. Uh, there, there's something really interesting here. If you look at his forehead, there's a little, there's a little blood stain of the number three. That this is all info that's on it. Yeah. What's the resemblance again? Sorry, questions at the end. Okay. All right. So he's developing the film. Out comes a positive image. This is the positive image, where the dark became light and the light became dark. Okay. So that's weird because normally when they would take a photo, they get a negative image. They get something like this. You know, where the light parts of the photo are dark. So that means the shroud itself is a negative image, which is, it's, it's really weird to have that in anything that was made 31 AD. And I say 31 AD because studies found that uh, the BC calculation, Christ was actually born two years before that. So that's not on the test, but. Because normally you get a positive image from taking a photo, and this is negative. Yeah, he develops the photo from from a negative to the the. I'll explain that a bit later. Okay, wait. What's the resemblance about the three on the forehead? Sorry. The the number three is a holy number. Yeah, and and the blood just so happened to fall in a way to make a three. Yeah. It's okay. Mm, not suggesting anything, but I am. So, how's it made? It's a very dumb question, because you, you, it couldn't have been made, okay? So there's no pigment, there's no brush strokes, there's no material, and there's no cracks from folding it. So that means it couldn't have been painted. This is not, this could not have been painted. There's no acid soaking, and we know that, because there's no uh, what's called capillary action. So 
if you notice, the blood is is right here, okay? And this is the only thing that soaks through the entire shroud. This imprint is not able to be seen if you were to flip it over. Okay. So, it also couldn't have been burned in. Someone couldn't have held a torch under it and just like really masterfully burned it in. Because it's not luminescent at all. There's no film developing errors when they were taking uh, a photo or anything because there's no silver compounds on it. I wish I knew the science behind that, but someone's got to look into it. It could not have been rubbed in, it could not have been dusted in, and it could not have been printed in. The image only appears when there's light hitting it from the front. Okay, You can only see it if there's light from the front. And it only appears when you're six feet uh, in front of it. So if you go within that range, it's too hard to see the actual thing. You can still see the blood, but you can't see the actual imprints. So this means that there's no substance on it. There's nothing, there's no little flecks of anything that could have formed the shape of a man. And there's no fungi from decomposition present. So when this man died, it's been decomposed. Am I going too fast? Or? No, you're good. Sure. Okay. So, how's it made? Again, blood soaks all the way through, but the image does not. So, for each uh, thread of this whole sheet, it's made of 100 to 200 fibrils, and only the top layer that we see here is what's burnt. So, it, it's a width of 0 0.4 microns. That's a measurement of how deep it goes into the shroud. And so that's very hard to do because you can't, you can't paint with that precision. So we know that it couldn't have been printed and like burned or anything because what happened to the actual fibrils is it, they aged rapidly. Like, I don't, I don't know how to explain. They just got really old really quick. And we can't, we don't have technology that could have done this today. We have so, so, so much technology and there, there's just, we, there's no way we can come close to it. People have tried and failed and we'll go over that a bit later too. Okay. So inside the actual fibrils, the cellulose molecules were chemically altered, okay? So the carbon bonds in the whole thing, they went from single electron bonds to double electron bonds. And that's how it aged that fast. And there are theories that this was done in like, there are theories that this was done in the middle ages, but someone in the medieval times would not have access to a controlled radiation source which is the only way that you can age those fibrils like that rapidly. Uh, oh, that's a redundant point. Okay. So 34 trillion watts of light would have to have been emitted to make that imprint. There's no human that can produce 34 million watts of light from their body. Like it, it's, it, it, if you can name one person that can, I uh, please tell me who they are. <laughs> All right. So radiation would also have to have been emitted from every single point on the body. So at every single point on that entire body, radiation would have to shoot directly up. And some theorize that the body released this radiation as it was dematerializing. This is called the fall through theory. Okay. So basically as the body dematerialized, Stroud was on top of it and it just slowly faded down onto itself while all that light and radiation is shooting out of a dude. Uh, humans can't do that. We all know who can. How did they have it prepared? No, but how did... What do you mean? The shroud itself, how did they get it? 
I don't know how exactly they got it. Someone found it, and then it went on a journey throughout, like, I think it was found in Jerusalem, and then it went to, like, Sicily and Italy, and then, no, not Sicily. It went to a bunch of different places like Greece, uh, I think Germany at one point, like the lower part of Germany, and then it settled in Turin, where it is now. It's in a big chapel. Uh, Italy. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going off what the book says. I, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, if we look at the gospel, Luke 22, 63 through 35, basically says that guards were beating and mocking Christ, saying, prophesy, who hit you? And so, if we look at the actual face, we can see there's a cheek came with hematome so the, a hematome is basically uh, a swelling of tissue on uh, on the cheek and then he has a broken nose and also here you can see his beard goes like in so part of his beard was ripped off that's not accounted for in the gospel but like I assume if you're a Roman guard and you get carried away you're just gonna Too fast, or? Okay. All right. Crown of thorns. There's blood through, blood flow throughout his hair and his head. And they studied it, and they noticed that it was due to small circular wounds in his head. Okay? Uh, and they also found arterial and venous blood. So basically, uh, arteries and veins, the different blood from that. And you can tell the difference because it is, so I think it's venous blood is a bit darker. And so that would be this here. And then arterial blood is right here. It's a bit brighter. And what they found was that the man who suffered was alive when these wounds were inflicted. All right. So scourge marks on the front, back, and lower limbs. These are claws caused by what's known as a flagrum. Okay, so it's a stick with a string with a small lead weight at the bottom that the Romans would use to uh, whip people. And they found that across the two sides of his back, so here's his spine here, down here there's marks that go, uh, like you can see the head here, and then there's a tail here, head here, tail here. And then on the other side, there's a head here and a tail there, Head here, tail there. Okay. So, different angles of each of those strikes, we can tell that there were two people whipping from each side. Okay. He also has large quadrangular bruises. So, those are just big bruises that they found on his back from carrying his cross. So, they found four in total one, two, three, four. And in this demonstration, you can see as Christ would have been carrying it, it would have been pressing on this upper part of his shoulder and on his back. Okay. And then I assume that it's on both sides because, like, as one side gets weak, you switch to the other. No. Okay. Different flows of the blood. Okay. So, basically, I have... A cool thing. And it's really Wait, cool. Couldn't the bruising also be like when they're crucified because they're like stretched from the far apart? Yeah, yeah. That, that could also be from that. Yeah. Okay, so basically, if we look at the blood here, if we look right here, that is his right, his right hand. But the photo, since it's a negative, they had to invert it. And so it looks like he has left, but it's supposed to be his right. Okay. So his blood there, if you can see. Ah, work. Boom. Okay. So his blood there sort of clumps up like this and then falls off to the side of the wrist. And then along his arm here, it goes like down, but it also like flex off in a few places. Whereas on his other arm, 
There's nothing that flex off. It's all just straight. So that is caused by changing positions on the crumbs. Okay. Let me get that straight. Okay. So in order to breathe on a cross, what you need to do is you need to take your head and you need to bring it up and over and then come back down to take one breath. Okay. So with that, when your arms are like this, the blood is just going to flow down your arms. But then if you move positions, this blood gravity is going to pull it off of your arm. So that's why we have on this arm blood flying down to the other side. And on this arm, it's straight because in this both arms are still straight. So blood is still going to flow in a straight line down it. Yeah. Yeah. You're pushing down. You're pushing down on a single nail and pulling up on two other nails. You take one breath and then you go down and you're hanging on that bottom nail and you're hanging from the two nails in your hands. So, yeah, Romans were very, very brutal. Uh, yeah. It's kind of amazing how bad you can how bad you can be to someone, but you know, they were studying it. They found the best way to do it, the most painful way to do it. That is blank. Okay. So, the nail. If, like I said uh, on Monday, so in a lot of our icons, the nail is through the hand here, but uh, in the shroud, and in, I think there's a few icons where they place it in his wrist, and so they found that the wrist was actually the only place that they could put a nail because if you put a nail here, your weight would just pull your hand off through your fingers. So they stuck it in there and it also crosses through what's called the median nerve. Median nerve. It's a big nerve that goes all the way through your arm and, you know, up into your whole system. So they found this little place, this little gap in the bone where you can just go through and hit the nerve, like the most painful part of it. And so because of that placement of it, you would have also had a muscle contraction of the thumb. So on the cross, Christ's thumbs would have been like this, folded in. And we know that because in here, he has no thumbs. They're just, they're hidden behind his hands. Okay. So, we also have a spear wound in his left side. John 19.34 says, But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. So, that, that directly corroborates it. And then, we know that it penetrated through the fifth and sixth rib, and it I think it touched the spine, but it didn't go through the spine. It did touch the heart, though. All right, so, so far, these are our Bible references. This is the Shroud Evidence, and this is the Gospel account. So if you go through this uh, later, you can see, like, everything corroborates itself. Okay. Uh, yeah. So... Blood test. They confirmed that the blood was human. So nobody could have gotten like pig's blood and painted it on or something. So they confirmed it's human and that the blood type is AB. M most likely, they said. But pretty certain it's AB. And they also tested the blood and it had something called bilirubin? Bilirubin? I don't know. Bilirubin, yeah. And so that is only released into your bloodstream when you're experiencing a lot of trauma and injury. And, you know, torture is a big part of that, so he had a lot of it in it. And the blood is still red. So blood this old, it would have turned brown or black by now. But it's red. And it's still red. So is this the water? No. Ah. 
All right. Um, so there's an image on this next slide that's kind of uncomfortable to look at. But if you've seen the fashion, you should be fine. Okay, Max, I'll tell you when it's over. <laughs> Do you want to see it? No. Okay. All right. Going once? Going twice? Okay. The shroud contains 3D information. So they found on the shroud the brightness level. Hi, Max. The brightness level of the face and the rest of the body correlates to how far it was from the shroud. And so they used some NASA imaging software to find a 3D model of the, the man in the shroud, as they, they try to call him. Because like, like on Monday, how I said that uh, the four core facts that all like, most historians believe in is that the disciples had experiences with what they believed to be the risen Christ, not experience with who was the risen Christ, because they don't want to like go right out and say that. So, more historical tiptoeing. All right, uh, yeah, that that's a crazy model. Like they have every single strike on him, down to like his broken nose and everything. Uh, oh, also on the shroud. They have one imprint of a foot, okay? And that would have been this foot here, this, mm. this flat one. Now, I believe that his right foot was over his left foot, right? Oh. Wait, they didn't say that? Like, one? Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. But basically, in this, the reason one of his feet is like this and the other one is like this is because uh, when they crucified someone, the Romans had to nail in a little like foot footstool thing. And then you put one person's, the person's foot on it like that. And then you put the other foot on top of it. And so this foot would have gone on top of this foot and this foot would have been resting on that uh, foot rest. Okay. So, Uno reverse card. People tried to prove that the shroud was fake, and they did this by trying like so many different things. I can't, I can't like explain how many different things they tried. But like this, they just coated a dude with oil and dropped it on him and called it a day. Like you're not gonna get that accurate. You're not gonna get a 3D model from that. That's not. It's not how that works. And so, yeah. Instead of proving the shroud is fake, they proved it was impossible to fake. So that just further tells us that it, it's a it's a real thing. And so here you can see, actually we're gonna play a game, real or fake. I'm gonna point to one, real or fake. 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 Real. Mm-hmm. Real. No. Fake. Don't fake. Yeah. It's in his, actually it's in his little background thing. Yeah. Okay. Fake. Fake. <laughs> Real. Fake. Boom. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> okay. So, some bad science was done on this. Basically, what they wanted to do was date how old the carbon within the fibers of the shroud was. And so they all took three different labs, took a, uh, took a piece from one corner of the shroud. So experts advised against doing that because you know it's better to get samples from everywhere rather than just one little place. And they found later that uh, a lot of mistakes were made. Mistakes so bad that they thought it was made in 1260 to 1390 AD. So again in the medieval time period. So they all cut pieces off of a corner and the corner that they cut off was held by a lot of clergymen who had to like hold it and then fold it back to like bring it to the next place. And so when all your pieces are taken from the same corner and that corner is a bad corner, you're all going to get a bad result. And that's what, we, what they got. Also, that corner was not part of the original shroud. So what they found was that 
the actual shroud had been sewn uh, with a border around it by some master seamstress lady. I, I don't know when. But they found that this part of the shroud was not the original part, and this part was. So, yeah. I assume that they put... Or that the other part of the shroud was sewn onto it to also, like, sort of hold it together. Because it is old. It's very old. Did they, sorry, did they get a piece from the original and probably that one, like, correctly? Or has that not been done? That wasn't mentioned in the actual thing. But I, I think they're just too scared to cut into it. Yeah. All right. So we found pollen and other substances all over the shroud. So they found myrrh and aloes, and those are all typical burial ointments for that time. And they also found a lot of pollen. And all that pollen pointed to the Jerusalem area. So you know it couldn't have been made in, like, I don't know, Athens or something. And they also found limestone, like small, small traces of limestone. And that type of limestone is specific to the Jerusalem area. So literally every sign is pointing to Jerusalem. You can see here the medieval forgery hypothesis goes through all these things and a bit more with big words that I don't understand. And then with the authentic burial cloth theory of it being Christ's burial cloth, Everything checks out. Yeah. Isn't that why Jerusalem is uh, the only rock built in limestone? I don't know. I didn't know that was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They also found what's called the Sudarium of Oviedo. Okay. So Sudarium just means face cloth. And this is called uh, the Sudarium Christi, which means the face cloth of Christ. So, on this and the shroud, they have the same blood pattern, and they also have the same blood type. That's pretty weird. And we also know that there was a sidereum with, uh, with the shroud that was left behind after resurrection. Because John 27, 20, verse 7, says, And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So this was completely separate from the shroud. You had the shroud and the face cloth. So why is it in the tomb? Why'd they use it? Basically, the final blood that uh, a victim would shed, they called the lifeblood, okay? And they had a lot of it on the, on the sidereum. And so the Jewish tradition was always to keep the lifeblood with the body. So it would have been in the tomb with everything else. Okay. Old, old, old icons. So, if you look here, this is the shroud, okay? And in it, there's an L shape of four holes. And in the shroud, there's an L shape of four holes. That's pretty convincing. Also, on the front of the shroud, yeah. So this is the front of the shroud. The orange is the back of the shroud. And we know that because it's folded here, but the front of the shroud has that herringbone weave pattern, so it's going up and down, up and down. And on the back of the shroud, it sort of looks like a cross pattern because of the herringbone weave. Also, blood marks identical. So one right there, right above the eye area, and one right there, right above the eye area. Uh, no, it's really weird. All right. So, blood in... That should be wrist. Okay. So, in this icon, there's blood in his wrist. And in the shroud, there's blood in his wrist. Corroboration is my favorite thing. Also, in the icon, he has long fingers. On the shroud, he has long fingers. I don't know the reason for long fingers, but... Yeah, that, that, that's a pretty uh, unmistakable thing. Okay. So, there are 11 similarities between these icons and the shroud. And someone who can read long paragraphs 
and not lose their mind to you. You look like a Rita. Wait, you're not a Rita. Read. <laughs> I found the no, that one. Yeah. Okay. Dang it. Hey, Max. Yeah. Okay. You read the numbers, so we know. Oh, yeah. Four. There is a male blood stain on your right wrist. Plate four. Five. No thumbs are visible. Six. Jesus' fingers are very long. Seven. There is a mark above Jesus' right eye corresponding to the reverse. Three. Blood stain on the child's hand. Eight. The child is more than the double. Is more than double of the uh, the body's length. Um. Nine. The shroud. I can't really see the five, and it wasn't mentioned like explicitly, but it's in there. Okay. All right. We have the Loeb slide summary, the explanation. Okay. Shroud was impossible to fake at any point in time, currently and past. No one could have made it with such anatomical correctiveness. So, if you look at the Bible, you look at the shroud. Basically, every single fact that we find in the Bible is on the shroud. So no one could have created a 3D image from 31 AD, a 3D image with that much like detail and like it's 3D and it's a 2D thing. Like it doesn't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna restrain <laughs> myself. It couldn't have been painted, burned, treated with acid, bodily oils from decomposition couldn't have gone into it and made this imprint and it's a negative image and then you factor in that out of 200 billion crucifixion victims there were not 200 billion crucifixion victims make note of that it's just if you calculate these odds out of 200 billion crucifixion victims only one could have shared the characteristics of the man in the shroud and Jesus' crucifixion. And who could that be? Someone say it. Someone say it, please. Yes. Amazing. How'd you know that? Okay. I have... Here, we'll do questions now because there's a separate section that I only have two slides of, but we can get through and it'll be great. Okay. Any questions on the shroud? Radiation. That, that, so, so when we when we say that things like Christ is light and these kind of things, um, that basically the theory is what that it was through his resurrection. The the light that came, you know, you know, our church is called the Holy Transfiguration, right? Mm -hmm. Part of that imagery of the Transfiguration is that the glory of God was revealed, right? The light of God was revealed, and it's a magnificent. The idea here is, is that it's that same light, the same light that Christ is, is that when his resurrection was happening, that light created the image on the shroud. Right? It's like it made its own image on uh, am, I, am I getting mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. 34 so, trillion yeah. watts of pure godly light. Like that? Oh, that's awesome. Does God like specify like the numbers or like who is the number? No, that that's just this is a scientific calculation about how much you would need to make that imprint. Like that, that's just, that's a minimum. I feel like it was a lot more. Uh, yeah. Any other? Uh, yeah. Um, someone just texted me. Oh, I forgot to use the mic. I'm sorry. Oh, wait. So the nose? <laughs> I mean, here's a 
the thing. When you break your nose, it's it's cartilage coming off a bone. So it's so not really a breaking of a bone. So it's a breaking of the cartilage. Yeah. Like separating so the cartilage I of your nose I from... Think the, the to confirm that an individual was really dead on the cross, they would break the leg bones. Why? Because I needed my legs to breathe. Right? So it's, it's the crucifixion is a slow death dying from um, uh, asphyxiation. Right? So you, you die because you're ch- like you're, um, you're drowning. Right? You can't breathe. And so when you're hanging on the cross, in order to confirm that someone would die, they would break the legs of their bones so that they would they would come down and then they would really because for me to get a grasp of air, I have to I have to get up. I have to get up over my on my tippy toes. That, that imagery of like getting up. So I would break the bones to confirm someone is dead so they couldn't breathe anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so there's a there's a there's a thing that happens that um, when they wanted to clear the bodies, they would make sure they would crack all the bones, they would crack all the bones, they would crack all the bones to make sure. But then they did not crack Christ's bones because he was already dead. Yeah. They didn't need to do that so at that point. Yeah. It's not talking about like his, all his bones specifically, he's talking about like that piece of his bone. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So at that point, when, they, when the soldiers went to go crack his bones, they were like, no need, he's already dead. Yeah. And they checked. So, they, so no bones on his body were broken. That, that's, the, that's the idea. Yeah. There. They also checked that he was dead with the spear into Wait, his side. Wait, isn't that also true though? Like, if you break your nose, isn't it just cartilage that's not going to your No, yeah. It, sure. it's, yeah. it's cartilage separation. Yeah. <coughs> but, yeah, for those who weren't here last week, this is Yohanan. He was 5, 7, and 24 to 28 years old, and he died due to crucifixion. They found him in a Jewish burial site. And basically, the facts they they found from his bones corroborate themselves with Christ's crucifixion, okay? So, like, he had nails that were put in through his wrists, and then the nails were bent at the tip. And it it doesn't say that the nails were bent at the tip for Christ's crucifixion, but we can assume that they did it because, like, nails would fall off if you have a whole person hanging from just three of them. So they bent them in just to have a hook there so it wouldn't fall out. And Yohanan died because his legs were broken. Okay? He didn't... Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Oh, I spelled breathe wrong. Dang. I checked that over a bunch of times. Okay. (coughs) Here's what we'll do. (laughs) Yeah. Um... So the next section is philosophical proof, but I can talk about another sort of like real life miracle thing. Do you think that would be good? I didn't have this plan. So we're going to go off. There's no slides on this. Basically, every year in Jerusalem at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Christ's tomb is, where Golgotha is, there is something called the miracle of the Holy Fire. Every year, during uh, our Easter, the Greek patriarch will go into the tomb, and he'll kneel next to the rock bed that Christ was laid on, and he'll say this ancient prayer that's been passed down from patriarch to patriarch. And then he's described it, or one of them has described a sort of film of light coming off of the rock bed, and then all congealing into a single pole of light, And then he gets two bundles of candles with 33 candles, you know, because Christ lived for 33 years. And then he puts them in and he comes out and everyone's like going crazy. Yeah, they spread the fire throughout the entire crowd. And what's weird about the fire is for the first 33 minutes that... Yeah, it doesn't burn you. you. Wait, do you you have a teaching degree? (laughs) No, it's just like... No, yeah. 
But yeah, for the first 33 minutes of it being lit, you can't burn yourself. You, there's videos of people putting their beard, beards in it, like putting their Are arms in it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Put the face in it. Put the what? Put their face in it. Yes. Yeah, there's videos online of people going like. <laughs> you find you'll know when the time is up. But also around the entire church, they have little candles and stuff, and those will just light. They'll just yeah. they'll ignite, and people in the crowd, some most of the time, little children, they'll be holding their candles, and then they'll just light up. Like it's I'm I'm not even so joking. I have goosebumps. There are people similar kind of conversation that even on the altar when the priest is praying and those who are able to see they see like this ball of light that comes uh, on top of the water. That's pretty, yeah. So I think the way that people know how uh, it lit because I went in there and there was uh, Oh yeah, with the, oh yeah, 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 you were just there. <laughs> what? There was nothing funny in that sentence. <laughs> you just <bring. laughs> Okay. We good? Capiche? Okay. Um, that's everything I have. On Monday, we're doing philosophical proof, and then that'll end chapter one of apologetics. And that means we're halfway through the book. So, yeah. We're going to cram three chapters into half a book. Okay. We're done? Okay. Abuna?